Hi folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for listening to the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. I'm very happy to report that the show's been kicking butt lately thanks to your support. We've been hitting the top of the charts in the United States, United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, Greece, I think, and a few other random countries out there. So thank you so much for listening, and thanks for leaving your views. If you haven't already, go ahead over to iTunes and do that. I really appreciate it. I also wanted to let you know that for the next week or so, I'm going to be giving away at least one of my eBooks for free every single day. You can go over to Amazon and download them for 24 hours each. Now, some of these are the Kindle books that I have with George of Civilized Caveman with recipes from desserts to crock pot to chicken, beef, all over the place, and they're absolutely delicious. And some of them are my own, including the Musical Brain as well as the Intro to Paleo book. So if you'd like those for free, make sure that you head on over to my Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash fat burning man, because I'll be announcing all of them there. You can also follow me on Twitter, it's Fat Burn Man. But once again, the, the best place to find those promotions is either on my email list or my Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash Fat Burning Man. So make sure you press like there and get all the fun announcements and the free stuff. Consider it our special thanks to you for being a loyal fan. And all we ask in return is that you leave a quick review on Amazon and tell your friends. We really do want to change the world and food is a wonderful place to start. All right, so on to the show. Of course, Melissa Jewel Wan is the author of the best-selling Well-Fed book, a wonderful, wonderful book. And in today's show, we talk about what it's like to do a Whole30, why soy oil is not, in fact, healthy, what not to eat if you have thyroid issues, and colossal fails in the kitchen. That one's my favorite part. All right, let's go hang out with Mel. All right, folks, we're here with Melissa Jewel Wan, the author of Well Fed, who blogs at The Clothes Make the Girl about her triumphs and failures in the kitchen, the gym, and in life. In her own words, she's on a mission to be a super fit, well fed, dressed to kill, glossy haired, rock and roll, tart tongue detective. I love that. Uh, it's a beautiful day in Austin, isn't it, Melissa? It's gorgeous. This is pretty much my favorite weather, mid-60s yeah. and sunny. It's not even fair. I just talked to someone in New York City, and it's like 19 degrees, and I talked to my parents, and it's like zero in New Hampshire, so I'm, <laughs> I'm stoked to be here right now. <laughs> I'm like outside getting a sunburn most of the day. That's not too bad for February, that's for sure. So I'm, I'm sure so many people out there know your work already, uh, and Well Fed is a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, but why don't you give folks just a quick overview of, of where you came from, your story, and it's a really interesting one, so I'd love for you to share it. Sure. Um, to go way back, as a small child in Pennsylvania, <laughs> um, I was an inactive kid. I loved to eat. My family owned a restaurant. My family was really into cooking, and you know, I didn't really think about nutrition or that I should be running around outside. I really like to read, and I play the piano. And I love to eat. And those things combined made me an overweight and obese kid and young adult. Um, and then when I graduated from college, I got, you know, kind of motivated to change my life. And I started following a sort of Weight Watchers-ish kind of diet. I'd gone to um, Weight Watchers camp when I was 14. Wow. Which was as fantastic as it sounds. <laughs> yeah, it sounds amazing. <laughs> you know, a bunch of like really nerdy, chubby kids like trying to learn to play tennis. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but it actually was really great because I did play tennis. We did aerobics. You know, they taught us some about nutrition and kind of got us on the Weight Watchers plan. And for all the things that I don't like about Weight Watchers now, and remind me because I'd like to talk about that. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of things that are right about their program then and now, like really looking at the psychological piece and, you know, the family piece of, you know, you're a kid, you're kind of eating what your family eats. So that stuff was really valuable. Anyway, um, when I graduated from college, I decided that I wanted to get in shape and lose some weight. And I'll be honest, it was primarily motivated by vanity. Mm -hmm. um, and it worked. I started doing step aerobics in my house and, you know, I, I ate um, fairly high carb, low fat, and I lost a bunch of weight and I felt pretty good. And then slowly the pounds came back on and you can take that cycle and repeat it three or four times. And that was kind of my young adult life. Wow. And then in 2008, I was approaching my 40th birthday 
and I got very motivated and I joined CrossFit and I started following the zone, but I ate the zone with no grains and I had some really good success and I finally got to the body that I wanted and I was really happy and I felt really good physically and then slowly I started feeling kind of fatigued and I went to the doctor and he found a thyroid nodule and it was pretty big which meant they couldn't do a needle biopsy mm-hmm. and to have it removed in our house we like to call it the throat slitting oh jeez the neck because if you can't laugh about it you're kind of in trouble yeah so my throat slit, I had my thyroid, almost all of my thyroid removed. And that was when I started um, following the paleo diet because it's really essential if you have any kind of thyroid issues and if you don't have a thyroid at all, like mm-hmm. I do, yeah. uh, keep inflammation down. Um, so that's kind of the nutrition and, and fitness side of how I got here. Um, the blogging side is that I had a corporate job and I've always been a writer and just really wanted to have an outlet for writing and kind of communicating with people. So I started my blog and like three people read it and <laughs> been there and, you know, gradually my audience grew and the subjects that I was covering grew. I initially thought I was going to write a fashion blog, which is why it's called the clothes make the girl. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time that I was starting it, I was getting really involved in CrossFit and I mean, I've always known it's what's on the inside that counts, but obviously when you're, you know, trying to eat right and exercise, those things translate into good health, and finally being able to wear the clothes that I wanted to wear. So yeah. it just became more interesting to me to write about those transformations. So there's still, you know, some snarky fashion stuff once in a while, but the content of my blog has evolved as my experiences have. So now, in addition to CrossFit and heavy strength training and running, it also covers yoga and meditation because in the last year and a half, I've had to adopt some of those practices because of continuing thyroid challenges. Mm-hmm. And there's some stuff about my thyroid on there. I share my experiences. I'm in no way an expert on thyroid disorders, but I've had lots of experiences in the last four years. So I share those and kind of try to answer people's questions and point them to the more expert resources that I rely on. Right. In there, I started making food and made a cookbook because why not? Yeah, it's fun. It is fun. <laughs> and I love your approach, too. It's not um, slap your wrist strict like so many cookbooks are and so many so many cooks are. <laughs> it's more like improvisational, which I really appreciate because that's, that's the way that I do it for sure. Well, and I think that, you know, cooking should be fun. And for a lot of people, it's a little intimidating. Mm-hmm. And you really can't mess up too badly. I mean, if you make something and you like the way it tastes, you've won. Yeah. You know, you've succeeded no matter what, you know, if you deviated from the recipe or whatever. If you make something and you don't like the way it tastes, just don't make that thing again. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Exactly. Like, but I, I know that particularly for people who are switching from, you know, eating whatever they want or a standard American diet where you can eat out in most restaurants, when you switch to paleo, it can be really intimidating because now you're thinking about having to make the bulk of your food yourself. Yeah. That's so true. Really I really wanted to make the recipes accessible. Um, if you look at the kinds of things I like to eat, they're the kinds of things you would get, like takeout, like Chinese takeout, or what am I going to eat when I feel like laying on the couch and eating pizza? Yeah. So those kinds of things, mm-hmm. um, because that's what I like to eat. Food that makes you feel good, and that's yeah. fun to make. So many people don't take that approach. It's amazing to me. <laughs> you know, With the amount of cooking blogs that are out there, it seems like a very, uh, very stressful thing for so many people. But the secret to doing it for the rest of your life and, and loving it is just enjoying yourself while, you, while you're in there. I agree completely. Awesome. And so put the love in the food. You got to put the love in the food. Yeah. <laughs> and the worst that's going to happen is it's going to taste like crap and you won't do it again. Yeah. <laughs> Which happens sometimes to the best mm-hmm. of us. Oh, I, I you know, I, I mentioned I'm working on my next cookbook and I had some pretty serious fails over the last couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. Let's talk yeah. about that. <laughs> what, what, what happened? <laughs> Um, I'll tell you the most colossal one, and it was really a heartbreaker because I I have to say that I really admire food bloggers who have a sense of humor in the posts that they write. My friend Hyla has a blog called Hyla Cooking, Mm -hmm. and she is a riot. Everything that she writes is fall down on the floor funny. (laughs) And 
I tend in, and she's that way in person too. And I tend to be like a lot more earnest. Mm-hmm. So my blog posts are much more like me. Like I have a lot of emotional attachment to food. I like the way eating food from another country kind of like takes you there. I like to learn about the culture of other countries and you know, what their family cooking traditions are like, but I don't, I don't think I'm a serious foodie, but I take that stuff seriously and it kind of touches my heart. Totally. So there's this cookbook called the enchanted broccoli forest (laughs) by Molly Katzen. And she was one of the pioneers of vegetarianism in the seventies and eighties. She was one of the first, um, cookbook authors and chefs to kind of be like, it doesn't all have to be boring, you know, brown rice and plain beans. We can make some fun stuff. Mm -hmm. So in college, I got her cookbook, The Enchanted Broccoli Forest. There's actually a recipe of the same name. Okay, so the original vegetarian recipe is a base of rice and cheese packed into a baking pan, and then you stand up broccoli florets like trees and bake it, and it looks like a forest. That's awesome. Yeah, it's adorable. (laughs) I made it in college and I remember at the time being like mildly disappointed because it was a little bland and anybody who's familiar with my recipes knows I use a lot of spices. Mm -hmm. I don't like things necessarily hot, but I do like a lot of spices. So I kind of had this enchanted broccoli forest idea in my head for, you know, 20 years, whatever. So I decided I was going to do a paleo version for my new cookbook. And because, you know, you replace the regular rice with cauliflower rice. Mm -hmm get rid of the cheese and add some ground meat for protein. And I was like, I remember it was bland. So I'm going to put some red curry paste in there and some coconut milk to make it creamy. So you don't even need cheese. And I'm going to season the broccoli first. So I you know, get this whole thing together and I'm super excited. And I've been telling my husband for ages, like, this is the coolest recipe. It's going to be <laughs> awesome. This is going to be the one that people talk about when they talk about well-fed too. And I took it out of the oven and it was the enchanted broccoli swamp. <laughs> it looked disgusting. I could not have been more disappointed. And I was like, well, maybe it'll taste okay. <laughs> and I took a bite of it, and it just, I can't describe how horrendously it didn't work. Just nothing <laughs> about it. And I was shocked. Like, I couldn't believe it because in my imagination, it had just been phenomenally cool. So I was like, all right. I can't bear to just throw it out. Like it's all this food. So I plucked the broccoli out and like rinsed it off and saved that to eat another meal, just like in a stir fry or something. And I thought to myself, I'm sure that I can take this swampy mess, mushy cauliflower rice and ground meat and curry and do something with it. And I was like, I could put it in a really hot pan and stir fry it until it dries out. I could bake it some more. And then I was finally like, you know what? I'm never, ever going to eat this thing. (laughs) And I felt like the worst person in the world, but I dumped it straight down the garbage disposal. (laughs) It makes me feel like a terrible person, but I was never going to eat that. It was going to sit in my refrigerator until it turned into a science experiment. So Fed 2 will not include a paleo version of the Enchanted Broccoli Forest. That's a shame. But that's the worst thing that can happen. (laughs) But see, everyone... I have a cookbook that sells pretty well, and even I mess up in the kitchen. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> and it's... I saved the broccoli. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> it's part of the process. <laughs> now, uh, you don't have treats in your cookbook, right? I don't. Um, Why is that? Well, I mean, my goal with, with Well Fed and with Well Fed 2 and really with my blog is to publish recipes that you can eat every day. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like the treats world is really well covered by a lot of people. So I don't feel like I have that much to contribute there. Mm -hmm. Um, And in my regular life, I don't eat treats very often. Okay. Um, And it's not because, you know, I'm holier than thou. Honestly, it's because I'm still trying to get as lean as I can. So I really focus on eating the things that move me in that direction. Mm -hmm. Do eat a little dark chocolate once in a while. Yeah. Um, and you know, for me, I don't have a diagnosed illness. So, you know, at Christmas time, I eat real Christmas cookies with gluten in them. And then I lay on the couch the next day and say, Oh, (laughs) I know why I don't do this anymore. Oh yeah. I've been there. (laughs) So paleo treats aren't really part of my life. Um, the other reason is because I really want the recipes in my cookbooks to be acceptable for people doing the whole 30. Okay. 
because the whole 30 really changed my life. So I really want to support other people who are doing it and treats aren't part of the whole 30 experience. They're great after those 30 days. So I, I'm trying to make all of the recipes things that you can eat without having to give it a second thought. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It, so it's, it's a safe cookbook. It is a safe cookbook. It's probably one of the strictest you're going to find out there. Yeah. Um, this October I did a whole 30. Maybe I should just briefly talk about what that is for people who aren't. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go for it. Um, so the whole 30 is basically taking the paleo framework and making it even more stringent just for 30 days. Technically you could call it an elimination diet because you're taking out, um, anything basically that's not animal protein, naturally occurring fat, fruit or vegetable. So all of the, all, everything else in the world is taken out, um, mm. processed food, seed oils, white potatoes, added sugars. Um, and then the other thing, the other like kind of philosophical layer over the top is that it's meant to help you reconnect with real hunger versus appetite and kind of resetting your eating habits. So going without treats for 30 days to see what are the triggers that make you go after those treats. Yeah. And what can you do in your behavior to manage that when it comes up later in your life? And then at the end of the 30 days, you reintroduce things one at a time and give it a few days to see how your body reacts. Mm -hmm. So once you've taken everything out, you can have, say, cheese and then give it four days and see if you you know, get bloated or you get a blemish on your skin or you feel moody or your sleep's disrupted or whatever. And then, you know, okay, cheese does this to me. I'm going to choose to have it on Christmas because I love it. <laughs> but I know that that's what's going to happen to me when I eat it. Yeah. Um, so treats are kind of an issue if you're trying to do the whole 30, because if you have any kind of, um, sugar issues, even a paleo treat will trigger those, the sugar demon. Yeah. As they call it. So that's kind of why I shy away from them. So how many times have you done the whole 30 yourself? Uh, I've done three super duper strict ones. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I eat that way 90% of the time anyway. Yeah. Um, I don't keep anything in my house that's not whole 30 compliant because when you eat in a restaurant, you don't really know what they're putting in your food. Yeah, you don't. And, you know, they cook with canola oil and they don't buy the good eggs and all that junk. Or so, soy oil because it's healthy. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I went on this yoga retreat and, I mean, strike one, it was a beautiful resort, but all they made was vegetarian food. Mm -hmm. So I had to call ahead and be like, listen, you, you need to give me some protein at every meal. Like, I'll pass out yeah. in the middle of yoga class if you don't give me protein. <laughs> um, but at breakfast, they were like, it'll be no problem because we always have eggs at breakfast. I was like, great, that's perfect. Except that they scramble their eggs with soy milk. Huh. And for people with thyroid stuff, right. yeah. you really, really can't have soy. Right. So it had to be the prima donna. I was like, I can't eat those. <laughs> um, but anyway, just to roll all the way back to Whole30, um, in October of 2012, I did a Whole30 super strictly. And I followed the autoimmune protocol. Because I hadn't done that before, and I wanted to yeah. see what would happen if I eliminated eggs, nightshades, nuts, and spices. Wow. Just to see if it had any kind of impact on my body. Right. Um, I will tell you it had a huge impact on my mood. You take away my cumin and my paprika, and I get really grumpy. Really? So, oh, my God. I was miserable because my food was so bland. <laughs> because you can cook with herbs. and. Yeah. Cinnamon is okay because it's bark mm -hmm. and ginger is okay because it's a root and turmeric is okay, but that's it. Wow. No pepper spices, no seed spices. I said to my husband one day, you know, I just don't notice any difference on this program. And he was like, I do. You are <laughs> really grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> so how long did that last? Is it the whole thing? It was, it was 30 days of agony. Oh awful. no. And then I had to reintroduce things one at a time and wait a week. So it was a while until I was a cheerful chef again. Um, but one of the things I learned is, wow, I have a lot of compassion for people who need to follow the autoimmune protocol of paleo because it is really limiting. Yeah. So one of the things I'm doing with WellFed too is putting notes on all the recipes on how you can modify them if you have to follow that. And some things you just can't, like a frittata. Yeah. 
you're never going to eat a frittata. I'm sorry. But by then, you know, people are probably used to it. They know they can't eat eggs. But in a lot of recipes, you can eliminate a spice or substitute something or leave the nuts out and it will still taste good. So I'm keeping that in mind as I put this second book together now that I've had that experience because it was pretty tough. And I don't, you know, eating out, holy crow. (laughs) Because eggs are binders in lots of things. Yeah. So if you're trying to avoid eggs, it can be really hard to eat out. Yeah, absolutely. Or trying to avoid anything, really. Yeah. <laughs> so well, and, you know, paprika makes things taste good, so people put it in everything. Right. Black pepper, you know, is a staple in mm-hmm. cooking. So yeah. it's pretty hard to avoid those things. So what did you learn from eliminating different foods? Which ones stood out for you? Um, I found that I one of the reasons I did it was because um, I've been trying to lose weight, lose extra body fat for about a year and a half and really struggling even though I eat really clean and work out pretty smartly. So I've been working with um, an alternative medicine doctor to kind of see what's going on with my hormones and stuff. And Mm -hmm. one of the things we decided to try was just to see if there's some kind of, you know, underlying autoimmune, whatever. Um, I didn't have any physical reaction to taking that stuff out. So I'm cleared to eat everything. Nice. (laughs) Good. Um, Which is a nice feeling. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, the biggest things I've learned w- were just, you know, having so much empathy for people who have to follow even a more strict diet than I do. Yeah. And, you know, I, I kind of sarcastically, but not really tweeted during it, you know, for people doing a whole 30 who think it's hard. Wow. Try the autoimmune protocol for a week. And then when you go back to just following the whole 30 guidelines, you feel like you can eat whatever you want <laughs> because you know, eliminating more food groups is just like, yeah, it's tough business. And people, you know, try to remove fruit too, because some people have sensitivity to fructose and it's hard. It sucks sometimes for, for a lot of us because eating shouldn't be hard. And if you have health concerns that dictate how you eat, it can get really challenging and that's no fun. Oh, totally. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing because you can be, there's a reason to not eat almost anything. Yeah. Unfortunately. Depending on who you are. It's absolutely true. Depending on who you are. And I mean, on you know, one of the things that I think is really cool about the paleo framework is that it kind of forces you to take a mature approach to your eating habits. You have to take responsibility and find out what works for you and what doesn't. And I really like that. Yeah. On the other hand, it can be really frustrating because it would be so much easier if you could just get handed a list and here's what you do and you'll have perfect health and you'll have a perfect body and you'll be done. Yay. Mm -hmm. Want to think about other things now. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I just feel like I've become very well acquainted with the notion of self experimentation Mm -hmm. and particularly as you know, I'm going to be 45 in a couple of months. So as a woman with no thyroid approaching my late forties, I'm realizing you know, my body is constantly in flux. Yeah. So even when I get, you know, something figured out for now, that doesn't mean it's always going to work forever. Right. And for someone with a personality like mine, where I really like to be pointed in direction and just go, 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 go. I feel like it's been really good for me to kind of be like, Hey, there's never going to be a, you know, yes, you're done. Congratulations. You've crossed the finish line kind of moment. It's just going to be continuous experimentation and having good days and having learning experiences. And that's how it is. Kind of like life in general. Exactly. <laughs> Look at me growing up finally at 45. <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting. Uh, it's, it's always a moving target. I was just talking to Gary Taubes on, on my last show about, uh, the one thing that started making him fat that was always fine, which was heavy cream. And all of a sudden, you know, he found himself, he's supposed to be this diet guru and he's like 15 right. pounds overweight. And he's like, what the heck is going on all of a sudden? Uh, and, yeah. and so he, he started experimenting and testing and it turns out he took out heavy cream from his coffee in the mornings. Uh, and the 15 pounds just disappeared almost effortlessly, wow. but he had been, you know, having it pretty much his whole life. And then something didn't work anymore. Yep. Yeah. And so that, that can happen. Um, but why don't you talk a little bit, I know that this is, this is an issue that's affecting more and more people, myself included the thyroid. Um, my, my mother and, uh, some folks on my mother's side have, have always had thyroid issues and my body temperature was around 96 degrees when I was a a vegetarian and I was having all sorts of thyroid problems. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your, your experience as it relates to that and how that affects what you do now? 
Sure. Um, I want to preface it by saying I'm only an expert on me. Yeah. And crazy things. <laughs> um, the temperature thing is really interesting because my whole life, I've my temperature has always been low, you know, between like 96.5 and 97.5. Mm -hmm. I always thought that was really weird. And I, you know, doctors were like, whatever, hand waving, no big whoop, you know. Um, and it turns out that is actually indicative of something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is kind of a big whoop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and <a> pretty slow, <laughs> sluggish metabolism. Right. Um, so, as I said, in, in 2008, they found a nodule on my thyroid and because it was um, too large to needle biopsy to rule out cancer, I had to have it removed. And it's a good thing because when I got in there, they found out that I actually had nodules on both sides of my thyroid. Oh, really? So, yeah. So there's a little piece of it left. And I think that, you know, the doctors were hopeful that that little piece of it would keep producing thyroid hormones. And I was not working with an endocrinologist at that time. Mm. So if there's, there's one thing that I will say 100% piece of advice that I will give, and I don't usually like to give advice, but if you have to have your thyroid removed, please also work with an endocrinologist because the person who's removing it is a surgeon. They are not a specialist in hormone deficiencies. Yeah. So you want to have an endocrinologist or some kind of alternative medicine doctor, if that's your preference, helping you after you have your thyroid removed because I had mine taken out and my GP... And the surgeon were like, oh, your numbers look fine. But the, the scale of what's acceptable for thyroid hormones is really fiercely debated. Yeah. And most doctors, most general GPs will say your numbers look fine when an endocrinologist would say, no, they really don't. They're too high. Yeah. So that's kind of what happened to me. I had, I, it's so painful to even talk about because I had just reached my goal weight and was feeling so good and looking pretty good. And I'm, I'm 40. I rule. <laughs> awesome. And then, you know, have the throat slitting, whatever. And then just slowly over the course of the year after that started feeling crappier and crappier. But when I went to the doctor, my regular doctor, he was like, no, your numbers look fine. I don't want to tell you. So I suffered through it for like a year and a half and then finally went to him and was like, you have got to refer me to an endocrinologist Yeah, because I would, I would wake up in the morning and feel pretty good and go to a CrossFit workout and do fine in the workout. And then I would come home and fall asleep for four hours. Like I'd been drugged, like couldn't open my eyes. So fatigued. Jeez. Um, and then, and so that was happening periodically. And then it just kind of became the way I was. I was just tired all the time. I was puffy, like my eyes were puffy, my hands were puffy. I was cold all the time. So when I went to the endocrinologist and he looked at my thyroid numbers, he was just like, holy crap! <laughs> oh, you know, you should be on thyroid hormones. Um, when you have any kind of thyroid issues, there are a number of thyroid hormones that they look at to see how you're doing. Mm -hmm. TSH is the one that is most often measured. That's the first one they look at. Sometimes it's the only one they look at, but it's really not enough. TSH kind of um, is the, the messenger hormone that says, hey, I need some thyroid hormone. Yeah. T4 is the inactive thyroid hormone. T3 is the active version. So your body sends out the TSH smoke signal and then it releases T4 and T4 is converted to T3 if everything is working properly. When I learned that's how it works, I was like, well, no wonder it breaks all the time. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Hormones sending smoke signals to me. <laughs> um, and, you know, every step of that, like TSH sending the message about T4 and T4 converting into T3. Um, so really, if you are just starting out on any kind of thyroid adventure, you really want to ask your endocrinologist to measure TSH free T4 and free T3 so you can get the whole picture of what's going on. Yeah. Um, I learned this past summer about reverse T3, mm -hmm. which is also a sneaky thyroid hormone, <laughs> Right. which can be valuable to measure too, because what happens is if you're bad at converting, which if you've had your thyroid removed, you might be, um, if you're bad at converting T4 to T3, 
you will make too much reverse T3. And that has all kinds of issues with your adrenal glands, which is what I ran into. I kind of had a full-on adrenal thyroid meltdown, apocalypse, <laughs> Black Friday, whatever. <laughs> um, so I spent, and I wrote about this extensively in my blog. If anybody's listening and, you know, they're curious or they want to know more about it, it's easy to find lengthy posts on my blog that go into excruciating detail about what I was doing. Um, but I did this wacky thing called Wilson's Protocol where you actually stop taking your thyroid hormones for a while, which was kind of terrifying to think about. Yeah. And then only take T3 in increasingly um, larger amounts for two weeks. And then you ramp back down for two weeks and you take your temperature three times a day while you're doing it because the goal is to actually get your temperature to 98.6. Mm -hmm. And then you know you've reached the right amount of T3 in your body because your temperature is where it's supposed to be. And then you start a real protocol of whatever your dose of thyroid hormones is supposed to be. Wow. So a big summer adventure. I had a notebook with me all the time. I got a new watch with an alarm. I had to carry my thyroid hormones and the thermometer everywhere I went. It was crazy town, but it worked. Um, and the other thing I learned through that experiment was I do much better on armor thyroid, yeah. which is a natural desiccated thyroid hormone, and not synthroid. Right. I say everyone should be on armor because some people do better on synthroid. Mm -hmm. So again, it's just this. You kind of have to always open your heart, open your mind, and be patient because you have to do a lot of self-experimentation and really try to find a doctor that will be your partner in exploring. Because if you're taking thyroid hormones and your blood looks, your numbers from your blood tests look good, but you still feel crappy, there are other things you can do. And you really want somebody who will explore those other things with you because if you're eating well, sleeping right, and exercising, you should not feel crappy. Right. In no world should you feel crappy. <laughs> you, know? you should not feel crappy. That's a takeaway point from from today's interview. I like that. Crappy. <laughs> so uh, I will you... say that all of that stuff, all of the experimenting with the thyroid hormones and and finding the right doctor, will not work if you don't take care of your diet first. Yes. So one hundred percent, I believe. Even though following the paleo diet hasn't given me the, the aesthetic body that I want, eating this way is keeping my body as healthy as it can be so that we can experiment with the other stuff. If you don't lay that foundation of solid nutrition, then you really don't know what variables you're playing with because if you eat gluten, for example, you could have a reaction that mimics having a bad thyroid. Mm -hmm. but it's not that you have a bad thyroid, it's that you're eating crappy gluten. Yeah. That's, that's a really good point. So along the lines of nutrition, there are certain things that you should not eat if you're having thyroid issues. Uh, one of those being soy. What are some other ones? Um, if you suspect you have thyroid issues and you still have a thyroid, um, cruciferous vegetables can be a problem for some people because mm -hmm. they contain goitrogens, which are a, a compound that can um, minimize thyroid function. Um, if you read uh, Chris Kresser, he has a lot of great information about thyroid stuff. And, yeah. you know, he says if you if you cook the vegetables and ditch the water that you cook them in, you're probably okay. You just don't want to eat, you know, four heads of cabbage a day. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so no cabbage soup diets. Right. Cabbage soup. Cabbage, here's the, the thing that he said that I thought was really fascinating is just that. If you if fermented is bad. So like sauerkraut is really bad for somebody who has thyroid issue, issues, which is kind of a bummer. Yeah, it is too bad. Um, and yes, when you cook the cabbage or broccoli or cauliflower or kale, um, you want to cook it until it's pretty well done, which kind of is counter to how a lot of people think about cooking their vegetables mm -hmm. and get rid of the water. Yeah. Um, if you don't have a thyroid, yay, we win. We can <laughs> eat cruciferous vegetables. It doesn't affect us. The <laughs> one advantage of having your throat slit. Yay. <laughs> All the Brussels sprouts I won. Oh <laughs> you can't gosh. stop me. <laughs> No, so it is, um, the incidence is going way up. I'm sure you know the, yeah. uh, the numbers better than I do. Um, do you know why that's the case? You know, I mean, I have my own theories, which I've concocted in my secret lair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's hear about that. Well, number one, soy and everything 
everything. I mean, mm -hmm. read a label. It's got crappy soy and, you know, high fructose corn syrup. Yeah. Um, so that um, stress is, you know, st stress, I feel, the diet and stress will, like, take your feet out from under you, no yeah. matter what you do. Like, you have to get those two things under control, absolutely. Um, so, and just the proliferation of garbage food in our food system. Um, if you, if you ask a thyroid expert, you know, what causes nodules, they say they don't know, mm -hmm. but if you, if you kind of trace back the trail of why they think autoimmune diseases come along, it's because of the junky food that we inadvertently eat because until fairly recently, you know, it was thought that soy was really healthy. Yeah. You know? Oh, most people still think so. Yes. And it, it, it seriously breaks my heart. I was I was ranting the other day. I know it's hard to imagine me ranting, but I was <laughs> ranting the other day because um, the March issue of Outside Magazine has a menu that they are calling a perfect day of food. And number one, there was no protein in it until dinner time, which right there, I'm, mm. asleep, I'm asleep halfway through the day if yeah. I had some protein. Right. Um, Breakfast was rice and winter squash. Mid-morning snack was a banana dipped in dark chocolate, which I will grant is delicious, <laughs> but is probably not the thing you want to eat at like 10 o'clock in the morning. No. I mean, okay, let's be fair. You want to eat that at 10 o'clock in the morning, but that would not be the best thing for you to eat at 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, you don't want it at 2 p.m. Right. You, you don't want to have eaten it at 10 at 2 p.m. Exactly. Um, lunch was a flour tortilla with black beans. Oh no. Uh, the afternoon snack was kale chips, which I was all about. That's a good one. Sure. I like that. And then dinner was, um, some steak and sweet potatoes. And I was like, well, if you just took dinner and multiplied that into breakfast and lunch <laughs> and threw those kale chips in the morning too, then we'd have something to talk about. Yeah. But it, it like, it really pained me that outside magazine is you know, a proponent of a day of food like that for people who they are assuming are very, very active. Mm -hmm. Like, I, uh, so like it, it, it makes me really sad because the information that's out there for people who are interested in taking care of their health is not that great yet. That's true. And people think they're doing the right thing and they want to feed their kids well and they're, they don't have all of the information they need to make the right decisions. Right, where they have the opposite information in some exactly. cases. Yeah. Exactly. So like that, that, it makes me sad. Yeah. We're running out of time, but why don't we quickly talk about this, this wonderful little quote that I stole from your blog, which is, the sillier the workout, the happier I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, you know, I'm, because of my um, adrenal and thyroid adventures, I've had to cut back on some of the crazy workouts that I do and I do really miss them. Um, but I still, I still work the silly into my workouts. Um, the thing, you know, as I said, I was a fat kid who didn't really run around very much. So I like anything that feels like playing mm -hmm. and I kind of preface every workout with, I bet you can't run 500 meters. <laughs> you know, like that's the, the tone of voice in my head. Like, but you can't, I just can't. <laughs> because that makes it really fun and makes it feel less like punishment and reminds me not to take it really seriously. Yeah. Because it should be kind of fun and it should be challenging, but not being able to do it is no kind of failure. Yeah. And I feel like people who are maybe afraid to try CrossFit or even afraid to work out at all, because, you know, let's be honest, there are still plenty of people out there who are intimidated by the whole idea of starting a workout program. Um, as long as you are moving, you're, you're in the win column. And then it's just, you know, fine tuning and continuing to find ways to improve and to push yourself enough that you feel inspired and that, that you make improvements, but not so much that you break your body down or break your spirit down because the whole point should be making your whole life better. Yeah. And that's kind of the approach that I take in everything I write about in my blog and you know, my approach to eating well too, like I am not the food police. You, sh you should eat a chocolate covered banana sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to continue to eat Russian tea cakes every Christmas <laughs> because I want to enjoy my whole life. 
I don't want to be in food jail. Yeah. And I don't want to live 10 years longer and have those, you know, have it be misery. (laughs) Right. So it's kind of finding that balance between enough indulgence that I feel like I'm living well, but enough self care that I can really enjoy all of that living well. What a great philosophy. All right. So we're out of time, but um, Melissa, why don't you talk about where folks can find you and what you're working on now? Okay. My blog is the clothes make the girl. And I know that's a strange name for a food and fitness blog. (laughs) If you remember the phrase, the clothes make the man, then maybe you'll remember the clothes make the girl, the clothes make the girl.com. And you can find me on Twitter at malicious 11 because I was also a roller derby girl and my skater name was malicious. And that, so awesome. that is hung around with me. I will never not be malicious in some circles, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's and killer. Well fed, of course, my cookbook is well fed. Paleo recipes for people who love to eat. Uh, yeah, a killer cookbook. I love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Melissa. And we'll <laughs> see you at Paleo FX. Yeah, looking forward to it. Awesome. All right, thanks a lot. Take care. If you'd like to hear more from Melissa Jewel Wan, you can check out her blog at theclothesmakethegirl.com. And once again, if you'd like any of the free ebooks that we'll be giving away for the next week, make sure that you head on over to my Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash fatburningman to get all the announcements. We've got recipes, paleo books, evolutionary biology books, pretty much everything I have on Amazon I'm going to be giving away for free for at least one day. So if you'd like the announcements, click like on my Facebook page. I'll also be announcing some on my mailing list, which you can sign up for at fatburningman.com. All right, folks, thank you so much for listening, and I'll be talking to you next week. Cheers. Cheers.